last dance in 20 years. Must be something special. In this town on Valentine's Day, everybody loses their heart. Roses are red, violets are blue. One is dead, and so are you. My bloody Valentine. All right, on this podcast, we are going to be talking about one of my all-time favorite horror films, My Bloody Valentine from 1981, George Mahalka. Uh, great little slasher film, Canadian. Yes. Great film. Uh, we uh, have a town, Valentine's Bluff, where 20 years prior to the large portion of the story, there was a uh, Valentine dance in town, and it's it's a mining town, very blue collar. Yes. And uh, there were still some miners that were left down in the mines that evening before the big dance, and... Uh, Apparently, we are shown that some of the supervisors had a little bit, a uh, little bit of alcohol, and decided to kind of break off for the party early, and left the uh, remaining miners that were in the mine finishing up some stuff yeah. unattended to. So the uh, apparently the the gas levels in the mine had gone up, and uh, it resulted in a large explosion, which trapped several of the miners in the mine. Uh, one of these characters we are shown is the only survivor when they finally dug them out. What was it, like a matter of days later or something? Yeah. Harry Warden. Harry Warden, yes. And uh, Harry, when they, they show him, they, they pull all the debris away, and Harry's there, and he's just, you can tell, completely insane, just lost his mind uh, in complete shock, and there's like there's body parts and limbs laying around him. Yes. And he's he's just freaked out. So uh, they skip ahead in the film to current day, which, of course, is 1981, as we said. Yes, and Harry Warren becomes kind of the boogeyman. You know, the boogeyman. Watch out or Harry Warren's going to get you, kind of the guy. Yeah, Harry you know? Warden. And uh, we're introduced to some of the, the local uh, young men and women yeah, uh, in this work town. Yeah, the mine. Yeah. Who work in the mine. Good old boys. Yeah, they're uh, like what, like mid twenties, late twenties, somewhere yeah. in there, and um, and they're girlfriends. Yeah, and we're shown kind of the the small town life of of a lot of these characters, and they all work together, and they they, they all they, shower together. <laughs> yeah, it's Quite interesting stuff. Yeah. yeah, they uh they they work hard in the mine, and yeah. they they drink hard after work. Yeah, they go to uh, Hap's bar. The One Haps. of my favorite characters in the film, Hap, who uh, apparently there's a, a bit of a, a mocking sort of sarcastic name for this guy because he's never happy or never smiling at any portion that they show him. In fact, he's like a craggy old bastard who runs yeah. the bar. He's like the old man in Friday the 13th. You Ralph. Be Crazy better watch Ralph. out. He's like Ralph, yeah. Yeah. You So you find out that uh, they're planning on having the big Valentine Day dance that they have not had in the town yeah. since that mining event that resulted in Harry Warden, that tragic night. So uh, we're, we're not really shown what's occurred with Harry Warden uh, yeah. after, after the initial premise that sets the film going, but... Um, <laughs> What what happens is we're we're introduced to like the sheriff in the town and the mayor and uh, Mabel, who's one of the local business owners there, who's got like a, a dry cleaners and uh, just you know quaint small town type characters. It's you know it's like some people you'd run into like a small towny type atmosphere, like Twin Peaks or something. Um, albeit they they don't have crazy quirks like they do in that that Lynch series, but just yeah. a small town and small town type atmosphere with these they're all they're very easily likable characters and and they do a good job of you actually believe that these people really actually really know one another and they're yeah. really friends and they interact on that level so they're planning on having the big valentine day dance and you know everyone's excited and as john mentioned earlier you know all the guys are having a good time showering up after being in the mine all day <laughs> and they can't wait to get in their their cars and hot rod off to go meet their ladies and go pound some uh, moose head beer at the bar, that big moosehead beer. Yeah, the moosehead beer. So they they arrive and we're introduced to. Um, apparently, there's a little bit of tension going on between the two main male leads in the film, uh, T.J. 
and Axel. TJ played by Paul Kelman and Axel played by Neil Affleck. Not related to Ben or Casey for that matter. Huh. So um, basically, um, TJ, we it's explained to us TJ actually had moved out of the town and tried to make it out on the West Coast and was a failure apparently and kind of came back into town with his tail tucked between his legs. And while he was out of town, TJ didn't waste a lot of time, or I'm sorry, uh, Axel didn't waste a lot of time coming in behind TJ and uh, picking up where TJ left off with TJ's girlfriend, played by Lori Hallier. Yes. And what what was her character in that? I was trying to recall her her name, actually. It's not... Sarah. Sarah, that's Sarah. right. Yeah. So there's a love triangle there between Axel and TJ and Sarah. Yeah, and Sarah still has feelings for TJ. Yeah, and, it's a little yeah. soap opera. Yeah, they got crap. like this whole thing going on throughout the film with that. But um, basically... Uh, there's some killings in town by a an individual who we don't know their identity. We just see them. Dr- they're dressed up in a a from head to toe black miner's outfit, yes. which is this iconic image that we have from the film. If you've ever seen anything uh, posters or anything related to the film, you'll remember this iconic image of this black miner outfit. Yeah, with the with the with the mask, with the gas mask, the hard hat, and the pickaxe. You know, and and from the beginning scene of the film, the film begins with a with a murder scene. You know, with this guy in the in the, in the uniform and this this blonde, smoking hot blonde bombshell. Who was that check. blonde? There was I, no one, wasn't she? It was just no, a it random character. Yeah, the the opening scene where they they just kind of go through the credits. You're you're under this impression that it's like some guy's taking his girlfriend yeah, to yeah. bang her down in the mine yeah. or something, and he's wearing this miner outfit, and she she's wearing a minor outfit also and she yeah. gets out of this minor outfit and she's like this perfectly in made lingerie. made up dolled yes. up blonde barbie looking chick who's yeah and she's got this Real little hot. heart tattoo on, yeah. on above one of her breasts and um she starts making out with the the male who, this doesn't, take, male. who doesn't take off his mask he's like yeah, his no, face is never no, shown no no so and he he kind of takes her in in a pseudo embrace but then you realize he, this is not something where he's he's partaking in something of a sexual nature. He's actually grabbing her and he thrusts her back on this pickaxe yes. that that uh, has been lodged in one of the uh, wooden support beams yeah. behind her. And then that's what goes into like the the title Runs her through. card of my bloody Valentine. Runs her right through her her heart tattoo there. And I guess no, I, well I guess she's the uh, she actually her heart was the one that. You know, the sheriff gets. Yeah, the sheriff gets. So, so the yeah. um, what what kicks off the sequence of events in this film is that, uh, as John said, the the sheriff and the mayor are actually tooling around in his SUV, and he he's received a candy box, uh, a heart shaped candy box that one would get on Valentine's Day, and opens it up, and there's always these little little funny little cute rhyming little phrases that are in these candy boxes that show up throughout the film where uh, the the killer is kind of toying with them in the film and leaving these like little smart ass little, little sayings in these candy boxes. And they, they basically dig further into the box and you see there's actually a, a real person's heart that had been cut out. That's been shoved in the box, you know, bloody pulp and all. So they start to to realize, hey, there's a problem here. Um, and then they go through this uh, explanation of when Harry Warden went nuts, when that occurred 20 years before, he went on a killing spree and he started killing some of the people in town and he would cut out their hearts and put them in these boxes. So they're starting to get a, a repeat performance either by Harry Warden or somebody who's mimicking those original murders. Yeah. Copycat. So, so throughout the film, you're trying to figure out, is this Harry Warden or is this somebody that might be continuing what Harry started with these murders in this this town? So um, we go through the film and, of course, they have the big Valentine dance. Uh, they're supposed to have canceled it officially. All the town people had canceled it, but they decide they're not going to have it down at the the local gymnasium or wherever the hell they were having it, but they end up 
transferring it to the Hanager Mines. Very smart decision. What they do is um, they have it at um, the mines at this point. It's later in the evening. They've been closed up, and hey, man, everyone shows up, and uh, like Hap warned them earlier in the film, you know, you kids, you need to watch out for Harry Warden. He's coming after you. You better not have that dance because it's bad luck. Yes. So, of course, they don't listen to the uh, the, the curmudgeonly old man and decide. Yeah, why would they? Yeah. So he, uh, oh, and Hap gets dispatched in the film, too. Hap decides he's going to play a prank on those crazy kids, and he's going to rig up a uh, some apparatus in one of the sheds out back behind where they would be throwing the this the secret party for the Valentine dance. And so he rigs up this minor outfit. Cause you know, that's really funny. You know, you, yeah, it's, it's re- real humorous. Yeah. You got, you got this well-known murder in town where they haven't, they, they've been so afraid of having this dance for so many years that while well, I'm going to show those kids, I'm going to rig up a, a guy in a minor outfit that's got a pickaxe in his hand. So Hap, uh, Hap's got his bottle in his hand where he clearly has been doing a little bit of drinking at this point. And so he goes out there and, He's rigging this thing up in the shed, and he shuts the door. He walks off, goes back over, opens the door, and the the outfit is rigged to where the arm will pop up with the pickaxe in it, uh, the way he's got it rigged up there, the suit. So he does this a couple of times, and he goes back, I think like the third time, opens the door just to keep testing it, because he's getting like a little sort of sick thrill out of like how it's going to scare them. Yeah. And the, the, the final time he opens the door... The killer is actually there and actually runs Hap through with his pickaxe. And <laughs> um, the film's very interesting because uh, at, at this particular point in the film, you realize uh, for the longest time, fans have pined away for having the version of the film with all of the gore effects intact. Yeah, because it was there was nine minutes of footage uh, that was cut. Pretty much every major murder scene in the film was slightly edited. Where it goes a little bit farther, it's just cut back. And for years, George Mahalka said that footage is out there. It's not lost, you know. But there was nobody wanted to put it together. Paramount. It, yes. And it was like a miracle. It was like hell froze over, you know. And when Lionsgate released that uncut version, it's, whoa. So, um... A lot of gore effects have been uh, reinstated into the film. There's a lot of really interesting deaths in this. There's uh, we got a a woman who's impaled on a shower head. Oh, Helen Helen Udi. Helen Udi. Helen Udi. Oh my God, that is one of the coolest murders ever. Yeah, this uh, this bitch gets like <laughs> shoved up on a shower head, <laughs> and the guy that she's with uh, apparently like you know again we have this equation of drugs, drinking, and sex equals death, and so uh, Miss Udi's character is with some dude that uh, he looks like a redheaded Dennis Quaid or something. I don't know who the hell that guy yes. is, but they end up going to do a little bangy bangy in the uh, the shower room, I guess, for the miners. And uh, there's there's some some couples splinter off and they go off to go f- or whatever. And so uh, she says something about uh, why don't you go grab us some beers? So yeah. of course the guy, you know, he wants to, you know fly out of there like the roadrunner to go get some liquor and that leaves her in there and so uh the guy comes back and he starts to get undressed because he, he hears the showers on so he thinks he's gonna he's gonna go in there and she's in there in the shower all naked and everything and he's gonna get a little action yeah so he, he goes back there and uh finds uh miss Udi's character has been uh impaled on the shower head where the, literally the the nozzle of the shower is coming through her mouth out past her lips yeah and the shower is on and it's just like pumping water and blood straight out and the guy just has a total flip out and then we got another scene where there's a character uh i think two characters in in uh in uh post coitus are drilled together yeah that was that was heavy and then we got uh we got a nail gun to the head action also oh, nail gun massacre yeah we got a little nail gun to the head and uh yeah, there's there's some really interesting deaths in this. It's nothing as as mundane as just stabbing somebody with a knife. No, no, no. It's a lot oh, cooler. We we got a um a hot dog face in the hot dog boiling hot dog pan. 
Uh, yeah, I remember that. We yeah. got that one, uh, and we got uh, we got the old lady shoved in the dryer. Oh, yeah, I remember. <laughs> I, I, oh, yeah, that's that's a funny scene. Now, now that I remember, this is actually pretty funny. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was. Yeah, yeah it, it's like they tried to come up with the the funniest ways to kill people in this film. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, nothing. There, there's nothing as mundane as just stabbing them. As I said, it's it's got to be something, something odd going on. It's got to be outlandish. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're led on this cat and mouse thing. Um, what one of the things that is really cool about this film is the the atmosphere of the film and the location of the film that's set in the mines in a real mine. Yeah. And they do a great job with the the cat and mouse between the killer and the survivors, who who at this point the surviving uh, young men and women decide that they're they're going to have fun and take a little take a little roller coaster ride sort of through the mine <laughs> on the mining carts, you know, yeah. to, to impress their girlfriends. And even though they're not supposed to for safety protocols, they decide to go down there anyways. So. Uh, they get down there and they get splintered off and fragmented into groups and the killer starts picking them off one by one, sometimes two by one, <laughs> I mean, just all sorts of stuff going on. And you're still not sure who the killer is and what's going on here. And uh, it's really cool because um, there, there's a great twist at the end of the film it, when they unveil not only who the killer is, but the reasoning behind why the killings are occurring today. Yeah, I mean, the motivation of this killer is uh, a lot better. And, you know, like the motivation of the killer and the prowler is just ridiculous. He just doesn't want anybody to have fun, basically. Uh, it's but, like uh, Mr. Uh, Wilson to Dennis the Menace. He just yeah. want, doesn't want him having any fun. And, yeah, if, if I can't have a dance, you can't have a dance. I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm just going to be the Rosemary Killer. But uh, That's a prowler reference. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, TJ's the killer, obviously. We'll just do a spoiler. No, actually, right? Axel's the killer. Axel's the killer. No, T no TJ's not? Oh, oh yeah, Axel's yeah, the... Axel's the, the blonde guy. Yeah, TJ's Axel's the, the... See, I don't know this film But see, what's well. interesting that you say that, because tisk, tisk. they did a remake of this film where TJ actually is the killer and yeah. not Axel. Yeah, that's why, that's why I messed up. Yeah, I was thinking about the remake. Yeah, and, that's uh, right. They explained it that um, <laughs> no, Axel no. did this because... Well, as the sheriff says, it, it, one of the funny moments in the film, actually, I don't. it's not played out as being funny, but it's kind of humorous when you think about it in the context of the film is they're, you know, the sheriff, they're all trying to put together this, this big mystery of why, you know, people are being murdered and everything. Yeah. And all of a sudden it dawns on him at the end of the film, once TJ and Sarah are, are coming out of the, the, the dust and everything from under the, the mines with having this big confrontation with Axel. Who, who you find out is the killer, obviously, at this point. Um, the, the sheriff and the townspeople show up, of course, just a little bit not quite on time, you know, just long enough to where they show up after all the major actions occurred. And yeah. So uh, they're trying to figure out why would Axel be the one murdering everyone, and all of a sudden the sheriff, in, in this humorous uh, sort of dialogue, just comes up all of a sudden and goes, Of course, Harry Warden killed Axel's father. Wow, imagine that. I mean, oh, wow, that, that little piece of evidence or, you know, no, no one thought to maybe follow that up a little bit somehow. Of course not. Yeah, so, of course, you know, he of killed course. Axel's father. So then we're, we're kind of led through this little, uh, you know, diddly-doo, diddly-doo, diddly-doo <laughs> flashback scene where they got, uh, they show Axel hiding as a young boy under his bed and watching Harry come into the house and basically stick a pickaxe through his dad's chest and he's traumatized and he's got this, this crazy psycho thousand yard stare going on and stuff. There, there's a fight that ensues between TJ and Axel and Sarah. And in the midst of this, there's a cave in and you think that Axel's dead. And at the very end, the townspeople are trying to dig through one side of the cave in and yeah. they, they clear away enough rubble to where they can see that Axel is still alive although his arm has been dislodged and it's kind of hanging like a bloody pulp and he's just completely crazy. And he's going, he's going, you know, Sarah, be my bloody Valentine. And he starts cackling, laughing maniacally. Well, doesn't, he, doesn't he hack off his hand or, or his arm? Like, uh, because it's like lodged in there in order to escape, he has to hack it off, right? 
and yeah, run, well, and run away. There, yeah, there's some sort of stumpy pulp. But yeah, just there. like that, like that, uh, that rock climber guy who you know had a, his hand that was. They launched. made the film with James yeah. Franco with. Right? Yeah, yeah, this is like a, a, a different version of that. But I wonder if that guy <laughs> saw. Is. I wonder if this guy saw my Bloody Valentine. He's like, wow. I, I wonder if I would do that if I was, uh, you know, faced with that situation. And then he had that situation happen. I don't know. It's a, it's a thought. Or maybe Harry Warden got to one of his parents too. It could be. Could so, be. So uh, the the actors in this film are very good. Um, most of them will not be known to the general movie going public. They're, they're Canadian all, actors. Yes. Um, but but they're all great with what they do. Um, and the the characters, as I said, they're all they're all depicted as though they all really are friends. They all really know one another. I mean, they do a great job. It's not like. Sometimes you watch like some of the earlier Friday the Thirteenth. It's like you, some of the characters are really hokey, and you you just know these people don't hang out together, and they're all kind of like just they seem like they're just amateur actors that they just threw into something. These people in this film are are actually people that you sympathize with, that you would actually have like a relationship with, and that would be friends of yours. And um, there there's there's actually some feeling when you, when these people get dispatched where you're like wow you know you actually don't want some of these people to die which is unlike a lot of people in the Friday the Thirteenth films where you're just waiting for them to die. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. So uh, the atmosphere of the mine was great. They did a great job of that. There's always this sort of sort of damp dampness and darkness and and little dripping that you hear just off camera of like the 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 stark cold and desolate nature of of the mind and and just the dampness and and uh it really plays well with having this this shrouded sort of character in in the miner's outfit stalking these people in in this mind and it's it's really creepy and it, it's very very uh, just as relevant today watching it as it was, I'm sure, back in 81. I mean, it's very creepy, and it's just as effective when you're watching it. Yeah. Do you think it was just as effective in the remake? Mm, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of remakes. Uh, my my heart's always with the originals, yes. but that, re that particular remake was not as shitty as, say, like Prom Night. The remake to yeah. that as it was of the original. Or House of Sorority Row. Yes. And... Um, Actually, from what I've seen, uh, a lot of the consensus is, although the original is like far and away the best, yeah. that the remake was actually entertaining. Uh, it wasn't something that I thought was like brilliant or great or whatever, but I can admit I was actually, I expected it, but when I went to see it, I actually was entertained from beginning to end watching it, but it, it holds an old comparison to the original. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I thought it was interesting how they kind of, the imagery of how they changed up Axel being the killer to TJ and how you actually got to see how TJ in the remake is viewing Harry Warden as if Harry exists. It's outside a whole of fight himself. club thing, you know, where he, yeah, he's projecting this alternate ego. Yeah. And, um, and it, it shot in a similar fashion, you know, as far as being like in this small town, type mining town, blue collar type yeah. town. And uh, Tom Atkins is in the remake. Exactly. And it's got the big gimmick of 3D, you know? Oh, gosh. Wonderful. Yeah. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. The, the 3D and um, yeah, very bloody. I remember watching it and um, it, it's a lot gorier. At the time when it came out, it was a lot gorier than what we had come to expect from the remake retreads of these horror films like Prom Night and Sorority Row. Yeah. They actually, they didn't mind getting the place a little bloody in some of the scenes in the film. And one of the things I always remember about the remake that's funny is the uh, the scene at the the motel with the midgets. Yeah, and, she gets iced. Yeah, there, there's like some crazy stuff. Who's the guy that wrote the remake? What's his? Don Farmer. Don Farmer, yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I know that uh, he took a little bit of lambasting after that that remake came out from certain from segments from many of, from many quarters of the the horror podcast community. Yeah, one show in particular I know is he's their yeah. their, uh, their particular their their beat up dummy, I guess you could say. Yeah, one of many on that particular show. But uh, uh, <laughs> okay. So, uh, but my bloody Valentine is uh, that's as I said at the the top of this podcast, one of my 
absolute favorite horror films. And again, an early '80s slasher, you can always you can always bet that if it's one of those early '80s slashers, it's going to have a a warm place in my heart that I'll have for it. And that I put that up there in one of my top ten favorite horror films of all time. Maybe even top five. Oh, in the Blu-ray, the um, we were we referenced earlier. There was a new edition that was released, Lionsgate put out, yeah. and uh, the Blu-ray looks beautiful. Yeah. And there's a lot of good interviews. Some of the stuff that was put on there, you can tell, was kind of put on there to kind of hype up the the remake to get people to go out to see the remake. But um, it, it's great because there's a lot of there's a lot of segments where they interview former cast and crew. So I really enjoyed seeing the cast and crew, how they look today, because as we talked about earlier, a lot of these people were Canadian actors, so you're not used to seeing them all the time, year after year. And it was nice seeing like Neil Affleck or Laurie Hallier, and just to hear their reminiscing about the film. And... Um, there was something I was going to talk about with that when I was thinking about the Blu-ray of that specifically. Um, cut footage, or well, the cut footage was like the gore, the um, yeah, which is it was shifts in quality. You can watch the film, you know, the R-rated version, or you can watch the the uncut version, and you can tell when the uncut bits come up, but it's it's still not highly uh, noticeable. Still, yeah, actually, what I what I recalled that I was going to talk about was. Uh, this is another one of those films, like uh, in an earlier podcast, we talked about the movie The Fun House, and I shared that that was actually, if not the first theatrical film I was brought to, that it was one of the, the first ones. My Bloody Valentine was actually one of the first VHS rentals that I remember, and I remember this was around 81 to 82, and I remember my family were actually all in the living room and we had rented this movie, my bloody Valentine. And of course, even at that age, I was like in first grade, I was like a big horror nut. I loved all the horror films. So, uh, of course I'm sitting like three feet away from the television where we're watching this on VC, uh, on the VCR VHS. And my family were like, of course, like on the couch or sitting like behind the couch, my brother and my sister and hiding behind the pillows like they're all and they're they're older than I am. They're all scared for watching this and here I am the youngest in the family and I'm I'm just like 3 feet away from the screen watching this and I just very much remember watching the film on VHS when that first came out. Yes, yes, I'm sure they had a lot of great memories and, and that that video box cover with the like the looked like the thought bubbles and that was uh interesting of, of, of the dance and Harry yes. Warden's masked face there. Yes. Yes, very serious business. What, uh, when did you see this? Uh, I mean, really, honestly, the first time I saw the film all the way through completely was the, um, was the, was the Blu-ray. Because I, it, it had shown on the USA Network on Saturday Nightmares. I'd seen, I'd seen parts of it at that point because I was obsessed with the USA Network. Never rented it on VHS. Yeah, now that you mention it, and, I do recall uh, it used to come on the yeah. USAs at certain times. Of- yeah, Saturday Nightmare. Well, it would come on all, I think it was on Commander USA as well. It was just, you know, it would show on the USA Network all the time in the late 80s. But uh, never rented the VHS or anything. Well, good film. Indeed. Don't forget, beware, Harry Warden. <laughs> Once upon a time, on a sad valentine, in a place known as Annie Mine, a legend began every woman and man would always remember the time. And those who remained were never the same. You could see the fear in their eyes. Once every year, as the 14th draws near, there's a hush all over the town For the legend they say on a Valentine's Day Is a curse that'll live on and on And no one will know as the years come and go 
of the horror from long time ago. Twenty years came and went, and everyone spent the fourteenth in quiet regret. And those still alive know the secret survives in the darkness that looms in the night. For the legend they say on a Valentine's Day is a curse that'll live on and on. And no one will know as the years come and go of the horror from long time ago. In this little town, when the 14th comes round, there's a silence and fear in the air. Remember the morn that the legend was born. All the shock and the horror was there. Or the legend they say on a Valentine's Day is a curse that'll live on and on. And no one will know as the years come and go of the horror from long time ago. And no one will know. As the years come and go, of the horror from long time ago.